this. All right, so give me a sec. I need to switch over to my iPad. So just relax for a minute. <clears throat> move all my windows around here so I can see you and see my screen. All right. So we're gonna bounce back and forth tonight. Um, kind of what I'll do sometimes with my classes in person is I'll give them something to try themselves. And then I'll say for two minutes, go check in with your neighbors and see if you got the same thing and then we'll go over it together. Okay, so we're gonna try that a little bit where you're drawing on your own paper. We'll go to breakout rooms for like a minute, two minutes to see if you all agree. And then we'll come back together and kind of um, break, break things down, okay? So um, what I would like for you to do to start with here, it's a good warm up. we'll kind of build up, is take a moment, a few minutes, a couple minutes, um, and, draw the Lewis structures for NO2 with a negative, that's a negative one, and H2O, okay? So see if you can draw those Lewis structures for those molecules. I'm gonna pull this down for one sec. So again, everybody should be drawing these two Lewis structures right now, okay? Try to do this without looking at your notes at this point. I know this is something you've seen before, but it's almost quiz time, right? We want to be strong and able to do these without notes. so. you get stuck, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Um, and then when you're done, if you want to drop in chat that you're done with those, that will help me get a get an idea of who needs more time. So drawing two Lewis structures and then done into chat when you're finished. All right, it looks like we're starting to all get done. So I'll give you another few seconds um, and then we'll pause working on that. All right, so go ahead and pause wherever you're at and let's work through Lewis structures. I'm gonna just do these um all together here but then we'll we'll get into harder problems and then i'll have you guys work together a little bit okay so these are if you want a recipe for your lewis structures 
Um, this is kind of my recipe. I guess we could put numbers on them if you want. This is the steps that I would go through as I'm doing Lewis structures. Okay, just to kind of summarize what you've been learning. So I want to arrange my atoms with symmetry to start with. So in NO2 negative, um, and let's use voices, not chat here, preferably for a few minutes. Um, what element is going to be my middle element when I set this up? And, 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 and good. Usually and whatever comes nice. first. Yes, I heard a bunch of echoes there. That's awesome. Um, so whatever comes first. Ah. Oh dear. Okay, hang on. Whatever comes first in your formula um, is going to go in the middle. And that would be true even if I gave you um, like a weird combination like fake elements, right? BX, CX2. Whatever's first is going to be what um, we put in the middle, okay? So whether it's real or, or fake weird stuff, okay? And then I'm going to have symmetry. So symmetry just means like, right, it's sameness on either side. Um, and then the next thing I want to do is valence electrons. So can I get one voice, um, someone chime in and talk to us for a couple minutes about how many valence electrons each of these elements have? And I'd love to hear from as many of you as possible tonight. It makes you stick in my head and I think it's nice for everybody. So um, if I can get a volunteer to talk to us about electrons and maybe some bonds here. So I th N uh, has five and oxygen has six, right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to slow you slow you down. Um, so nitrogen has five valence electrons. And now that you've done more of these, you can start to kind of have the mindset to leave the unpaired electrons in the middle of the molecule, because that's where our bonds usually form, right? Is everybody good with nitrogen having five electrons? This is a safe space to be like, back up. Wait, I don't understand. Okay, and then oxygen, I think was that Matt that was helping us? Um, Oxygen has six valence electrons. So make sure you have four unpaired and then you pair two of them up. And I'm leaving the unpaired electrons kind of facing towards the middle. So that's my next task done. Um, Matt, if I can stay with you to be my helper here. Now I see that I should add a charge. Does that affect me in this Lewis structure? I think I might've done it wrong. So I'm, I'm unsure. <laughs> Okay, can we can we work together and guess? Um, so do you see a charge in the compound that you've been given? Um, I'm coloring it for you to try to <laughs> emphasize it. See how it says NO2 and then it had a negative by it? See this negative up here? So NO2 and then that negative means I have a charge. So oh, a negative that, charge? Yeah, so do you know what that means in terms of electrons for my structure? Um, can I get a... Um, Phone a friend? <laughs> Someone else? Add an extra electron. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. I think you guys are both saying the same thing. An extra electron? Yeah, so if I have a negative one charge, that means I get a bonus negative, which is a bonus electron, okay? We always want to put that on the highest electronegativity element. Or if you aren't sure about that, at least go to the outside of the molecule, okay? So here I can go on either one of my oxygens. I'm just going to go to the left for no good reason. But you want to add that one electron here because of the negative one charge. Is everybody good on that, adding that electron? Okay. Now I want to draw bonds. So Matt, are you up for helping us on connecting some bonds here? Oh, sorry. Before we move on. Yes. By that is that when we do the little x yes so okay. i just did a dot but i think when i taught it on the videos for me and teaching it sometimes it helps to be like here's the special electron right and that could go on either side too so it could have gone over here too um thank you nancy yeah y'all feel free to interrupt me all night long okay um matt are you up for more or do you want me to have someone else help us with bonding here um, have someone else if that's cool. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Can someone else help us out with bonding? So I think that the nitrogen and the oxygen can share a bond because the two on the outer side, yeah. And then the other ones can share a bond as well. Good. And then the ones underneath, have, they're equal to, so we can put another bond there. Perfect. And then I'm stuck. 
Okay. <laughs> so okay. let's pause. Do, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Wouldn't we do the same to the other side as well? Mm. Just bring down, bring down one to the bottom. Good question. So let me undo that last bond that Tiani talked us through there. So this was one of the things you guys floated in your um, discussion board questions. You're like, when do I put the two lines and when do I not? When do I put a double bond and when do I not? That's kind of what you're thinking about too, right, Trey? Like, should I be adding extras here? So Tiani, let me go back to your wisdom here, okay? You only gave us one double bond. This is a double bond. How did you know to put that double bond there? Why did you choose that? Can you say some words about that? Um, Just because they both are basically, I'm, how I pictured it, like they're both in the same place so they can be connected together just just because they're both, you know, on the outside. But the one that's underneath the O, like the N already shared it with the other oxygen. So I was like, how how do we even, what do we do with that? You know, cause it's not like you just leave it there or anything. But that's okay. how I did the uh, other oxygen in nitrogen. Okay. Good. So I think kind of to, to highlight what Tiani is saying is Tiani's noticing, Tiani's probably a good friend. Tiani's like, oh, you look lonely <laughs> and you look lonely. So let's hang out, right? Um, so that's how we pick, Trey, which electrons to connect with each other. If you look over here, because of that extra electron we added on, this is the same as saying, oops, same as saying that there's two electrons here. So if you have a pair then you don't form a bond with those electrons that are already in a pair. So that's why we only form the double bond on the one side and not on the other, because it's only the, the lonely electrons that we end up forming a second bond with. Um, does that help? Or do you want to say some words about that, Trey? How that doesn't yeah, make sense? I, I understand. I was going to say, isn't that with the negative? I know that there should be like one that's not double bonded. So that's why I was just making sure. Yeah. And this is what our negative one had added on for us, right? It was that one extra electron. So yeah. So when you're thinking, should I put a double bond or not? The way that you're going to figure out if you should put a double bond or a single bond at step four is by doing your atoms in the right place, your valence electrons in the right place your charge in the right place, and then you only form a double bond if you see those lonely unpaired electrons. Otherwise, you're done, okay? Um, any questions on that before we go to our last step five here? All right, add brackets. Do I need brackets on this Lewis structure? Yes, you do. I do, why? How do I know that? Because it was a negative. Perfect, so brackets, and then I put whatever that charge was there, okay? Um, questions on that? So you all had a fake problem last week on your um, quiz, right? And there were some struggles on those. I hope you've been able to practice and spend some good hours um, practicing, watching more videos, um, asking me questions. Um, but hopefully if you see something similar to this, but with say fake elements this week, you know what to do, okay? Um, let's talk about water real quick. So we can take water through the same process, right? And water, hopefully you've got that memorized by now, but same process, atoms with symmetry. So O with my H's. Valence electrons. How many valence electrons does hydrogen have? One. One and one. And then oxygen has? Six. Six. Good. Keep us going here, Casey. Now notice when I put the six, I'm kind of leaving space for those middle electrons to pair up. I'm kind of thinking ahead now that you've done a bunch of these. And then Casey, you want to keep us going? Um, where do I put mm -hmm. bonds? Uh, then the hydrogen and oxygen pair up the electrons. Yeah. And then the other side also. So single bonds on each side. Good. And Casey, how would I know not to put a double bond here? Because there's no other electrons to pair up. The electron shells are complete. Good, good. So do we see, does everybody see how all those, we have a pair and a pair and then there's nothing sitting on hydrogen anymore. So there's no, no place to bond over to hydrogen and add a double bond. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Questions? All right. Yeah, uh, I know we're on the, from the last one. How did you say we know when to add brackets again? So we add brackets if there's a charge. So for example, NO2 had a negative charge. Am I gonna put brackets on water? No, because there's no charge on water. And the charge that I'm looking at is this thing right here. Um, does that answer your question, Trey? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. Um, so 
we only need brackets if it's a if it's an ion okay um anything else here to touch on lewis structures because we're going to now build on lewis structures for the rest of the night um so in some problems it shows them like bent do you want us to redraw it with the electrons on top to make it more bent or is it okay like that oh, okay great question so if i ask you for a lewis structure we tend to have the etiquette of just 90 degree angles, make it linear, make it very square. So I don't care if it's in the right geometry on a Lewis structure, but then this was a question someone asked and I've got it in person too. So it's not just you, it's, it's everybody. Um, when we go to draw the molecular geometries, that's where we have to think about how I should be drawing it. But if I just ask you for a Lewis structure, just connect those valence electrons. So now when I go to do my molecular geometries, um, let me jot over here, okay? So again, kind of a recipe. So molecular geometry, first I need the Lewis structure. Second, I need to think about electron groups. Third, then I can think about, um, the molecular geometry after that okay but i have to think about the electron groups first and the electron geometry first so when i look at the no2 and i know i just kind of shrunk this down but when i look at the no2 how many electron groups do i have in this molecule up here everybody how many electron groups do i have in this no2 negative Three. I see some threes. I hear some threes. Yeah. So I have three electron groups. And what I'm looking at, I guess let me switch here, is this is an electron group. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm allergic to electrons. Um, here's an electron group. And then don't forget about your, your ghost, your electron pair, right? So I've got three electron groups. Can't stop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so three electron groups. What does that mean that my electron geometry is? So I have three electron groups, and that means what? What are the words to describe my electron geometry? Trigonal, uh, trigonal planar. Yeah, perfect. Who was that, Ricky? Um, so trigonal planar. Good. And so trigonal planar, I've got in my head. This is kind of what trigonal planar looks like, right? That triangle that you've been working on. Now, when I go to write my NO2 on that though, let's think about, oh, and what's the bond angle? We can know bond angles at this point too, right? Trigonal planar electron geometry means what bond angle? 120. Good, thank you, Nancy. So now when I go to fill in from what I was doing before, my nitrogen, my oxygen, my other oxygen and all my lone pairs, do you see what happened to my molecular geometry? What kind of molecular geometry am I looking at here? So what does this shape look like here? Is it bent? Bent. 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 Yeah, I hear a bunch of bents there. Does that make sense? Can everybody see that, how I got to that molecular geometry? And what is the angle on this bent molecular geometry? Hint. 120 degrees, yeah? So it's based on the fact that it was trigonal planar. That was a 120 degree kind of electron arrangement. So this bent has a 120 degree angle. Um, so what we're saying, right, is this angle here is 120 degrees, okay? Questions on that? Or anything you wanna rewind or hear again? So because there's, I mean, there is um, three groups, right? Mm -hmm. But because um, there's no other molecule right there on the mm -hmm. top, that's why it's bent? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I have that ghost that's kind of taking up space, right? And so it's saying we got to squeeze everything down into that bent geometry for the molecule. Um, I don't think I added anything by what I said, but yes, you're exactly right, Nancy. Um, questions, anything else to clarify on that one? 
Okay, so let's do the same thing with water now. Okay, so if I look at water, all of our earlier work is paying off. How many electron groups do I have on a water molecule? You guys can all talk over each other. That's highly encouraged. How four. many electron groups? Four. Is it four? four. So I see the two H's and then yeah, both of these electrons count as an electron group. Okay, remember electrons are all negative. And so they are repelling each other like repels like when we talk about electrons. So I've got four electron groups. Um, can everybody see that those four electron groups? You good on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So four electron groups then is going to give me what kind of electron geometry tetrahedral yeah. yeah tetrahedral good i hear lots of you i'm a total nerd when it comes to zoom stuff like i'm happy to hear the happy birthdays where everyone's like you know singing to each other and totally out of tune because it just means everyone's trying so same when you guys all talk over each other it's a happy sound to me it's just like good chaos all right so tetrahedral so if i can think about what tetrahedral looked like this is the tetrahedral kind of shape, right? That's where my four electron groups are in that shape, all right? So when I go to put atoms on this, okay, I put my O, and then it doesn't matter where I put my H's, but I'll just put them here. And then I have two lone pairs. What do I see as my molecular geometry for that water? It looks bent. Yeah, it does look bent. That's because it is bent. Good. Let me back up here. What was the bond angle when we decided that we have a tetrahedral electron geometry? What's the bond angle? 109.5. Yeah. And I see Tiani had that in chat today too. Tiani, you're on top of this stuff. I can tell you've been working hard on it. Good job. Um, so this is bent, but now do you see the difference here? This is a bent with 109.5 and the one above it is bent with 120 degrees. Why is this one getting a little bit less space? Does anyone have words for that? Why is my bond angle a little smaller? Why is everything more crowded? Because it has an extra group of electrons. Yeah, Michael, awesome. All right, so here we have two electron pairs. Now we have two ghosts living with us that are squeezing everything down. And we only had the one ghost that was squeezing us together in the other vent. Okay. Um, so we just kind of thought through electron geometry and then molecular geometry and the bond angles. And we can see the difference in the two bent um, molecular geometries. Questions, anything to throw out, ask, clarify? Professor, I have a question. When do you know when to put the little triangle or the little lines? Mm, on the tetrahedral? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Great question, Elaine. So um, we only use it if we have to. So if I have, uh, I don't have enough space on here. Let me erase some of this stuff, okay. So if I have um, my tetrahedral electron geometry, right, looks like this. We always want to be thinking about a wedge and a dash and a straight line and two straight lines, okay? So that's, that's the universal way we draw this all over the whole world, okay? So I could take that and I could put four atoms on. And so then I need to draw the line, the line, the wedge, the dash, if that was like CH4. Are you with me on that, Elaine? Yes. Okay, now other scenario is you could have, again, draw the same wedges and dashes to start with. Um, I could have something like NH3, and that has a lone pair. So then all I need to draw, if I'm drawing that molecular geometry is the trigonal pyramidal kind of picture, the molecular geometry that I'm looking at, because I don't have to show that top piece of it. So now it's looking like trigonal pyramidal, still using the dash and wedge though. You with me on that? Okay. And then the last option when we have that tetrahedral electron geometry, right? I start knowing four groups, need some space. Um, this is the one where I actually don't need to use the wedge and the dash. If you do, that's fine. But this would be like water. And water, if we build it, is actually planar. Like it just can lay flat, that molecule can when you built those. And so this is where I wouldn't use the wedge and the dash usually if it's um, 
if it's a, a bent from a tetrahedral. So usually the dash and the triangle is for the, te the tetrahedral one. Yes, it's only for tetrahedral. We don't need it on the other one because on the um, trigonal planar, because that's planar. So plane oh. means no wedge and dash. It's only when it goes 3D, like okay. you saw with the models that you need it. And so the only times you're going to need it are actually on the tetrahedral molecular geometry okay. and the trigonal pyramidal molecular geometries. Those are the okay. only ones with wedge and dash. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank really you. Good question. Um, how are we doing so far? Is this helpful in seeing the patterns like be coming together here? Yeah, give me some uh, <laughs> some reactions and a reaction that's not positive is fine too if you want to, I don't know, make a crying face or something, that's fine too. Um, all right, so let's take that and we'll work on polarity and then we'll take a little break and we'll tie that together with intermolecular forces, okay? Um, so polarity, <clears throat> here's my kind of little checklist for us. We've worked our way up to molecular geometries now. We're gonna need electronegativities, which outside of the quiz, you should be using your electronegativity table, right? You have an electronegativity table in your lecture notes. You've hopefully been using a lot. We need to be able to do bond dipoles, molecular dipoles, and then decide if it's a polar molecule. That's the order that I'm kind of thinking through these in, okay? Um, so uh, to put colors on these, remember my molecular dipole, I've been using the pink arrows. I realize if you're colorblind, actually the pink is not a good, good choice. Um, but, and then the bond dipoles were the smaller arrows, okay? So I'm gonna sketch out for you um, CH4. Go back to my favorite pink color here. So CH4, and then also CH2F2, okay? Um, so I want, you guys to take, this might take you about five minutes. So drop some duns in the chat when you're done. So you've got some Lewis structures. I need you to put these, redraw them in the right molecular geometry, figure out the electronegativity of every atom, and then give it your best shot to put bond dipoles, molecular dipoles, and tell me if this is a polar or nonpolar molecule. Okay, so that'll take about um, five minutes probably. Um, go ahead and work on that. I can, I can open break, like in class, I'd have you all talk as you do this. If anyone wants to go into a breakout room, let me know. I can open some of those, but otherwise I'll just let you kind of sit and then we'll go over it together. So we're going through these five steps for these two molecules. Okay. And if you bump into any questions along the way, just speak up and ask me about whatever you're stuck on, okay? I remember you saying in the video that the C and the H is significant for something, but I'm, I'm trying to remember, because I remember this one. 
I'm trying to remember exactly what you said about the C and the H. Does anyone remember? Do you remember? Go ahead. Was someone saying something? Carbon has like six, right? Say that again, Trey. Carbon has six. Like carbon, it does. How about carbon with hydrogen? There's something Tiani's trying to remember because that's going to be a bond we see a lot all semester. Anyone remember? It's the automatic hydrogen bond, I think it is. No, it's nonpolar. No. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. You were half right. It's automatic. Every time you see CNH, you're thinking automatically nonpolar. Non so that's what you're trying to remember there, Tiani. And what does that mean, Tiani, for dipoles? If it's an automatic nonpolar, do I put a bond dipole on it? No. Never. All right. So excellent little tip for the class there. CH, automatic nonpolar because the electronegativities are similar. So no bond dipoles on it. Thank you, Tiani, for that little commercial break. So keep working. Um, <laughs> Drop in chat once you guys are done, um, but no, no rush. And just remember, you're an awesome human being, whether you can make sense of dipoles or not, <laughs> but we're hopefully getting better at that too. Um, if anybody's feeling stuck, can you drop in chat just so I know that you're feeling like totally stuck? You can private message me too if you don't want to say it to everybody, but I just want to make sure if there's anyone out there feeling stuck that we can help you get unstuck. Maybe another minute more or so, and then we'll work through this together. All right, yeah, Justin's confused on what's polar and nonpolar. That was a common discussion board comment. So that's, that's why we're doing these, so we can work on that. about 30 more seconds and then we'll check in. Um, thank you for the messages too from a couple of you. So you're, you're all getting to the point where you have to draw those arrows now, the dipoles, right? And that might be where you're like, ah, what do I do? All right. So go ahead and pause wherever you're at and let's let's work on these together a little bit, okay? So I drew the molecular geometries. Hopefully you're able to do that. That's what we were just working on. So four electron groups. So we need to draw a tetrahedral electron ge or a molecular geometry. So everybody with me on that? We're good on that, I think, right? Um, now, just a note on something like this CH um, with the F. Sometimes you might see that written or drawn out in a different way with fake elements or real elements. Maybe it looks something like this, where it looks all nice and symmetrical. Okay, see what I just did there? I just moved an H and an F. No matter what the Lewis structure looks like, it's always gonna be a helpful hint when you go to draw the molecular geometry 
to put atoms that are like each other together. So you don't have to keep them far away from each other. If you played with your models last week at all, you could kind of see that those like atoms actually kind of look like they're together on a tetrahedral molecular geometry. So even if they're separate here, it's always a good, it's my little thought bubble, I guess, upside down, <laughs> little thought bubble, put those like atoms together. And that's going to make it easier when we get to the arrows later on. Okay. Um, any questions on that? You guys follow what I was saying there? So keep those Fs together. All right. So yeah. now that I've got, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say that's actually really helpful because on the notes, I, I saw that that was uh, placed twice. And the mm -hmm. first time I got it right, and I saw because I put them together. And then the second one, I put like the Fs crossways and I put nonpolar because I assumed that like um, apart. Even yeah. Mm -hmm. but, like, that's that was like one of the questions I had. So but, it's always to just put the molecules together, right? Like the atoms. Yeah. So put the like atoms together always. Um, and it even it doesn't even matter where you do that. Like because if you if you played with the model, then you would find out that this was actually exactly the same thing. Like it doesn't even matter where I put them as long as I put them together. Um, so thank you for chiming in on that, Andrew. That's really helpful. So now I want to do electronegativities, okay? So on a quiz question with fake elements, maybe the electronegativities are given to you. But otherwise, you've got your table of electronegativities, right? So let's um, fill in electronegativities. Carbon is 2.4, 2.5? Why am I forgetting? Help me out here. 2.5. It's 2.5. Okay, so I'm filling in electronegativities from the periodic table on all of these. And this is gonna make it very obvious what to do next, okay? So if you're working with fake elements, you do the same thing. You just fill in the electronegativities that you're given, okay? Um, is everybody good with me? Anyone need to know where those numbers came from? Are we clear on that? Yeah, I'm curious to know where the numbers came from. Okay, and I didn't, I didn't put one in my slides here, but you should have in your lecture notes a periodic table but instead of it looking like this, it's on a couple of the pages in your chapter three lecture notes, um, you've got electronegativity. So 2.5, 3.0, 3.5, 4.0. See if you can find that in your chapter three lecture notes, Therese. That's where I'm grabbing those numbers from, okay? I see it, thank you. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, all right, so then I find those, I put them on here. Who wants electrons more, the big numbers or the small numbers? The big, big thing. numbers. Yeah, thank you, Lidiana. So now I want to go through for the bond dipoles and I want to look at one bond at a time. And along with that, I want to remember that C and H is always a nonpolar bond. Okay. So I'm looking for basically tug of war, or we said um, a couple analogies I've heard this week who's got more custody of the electrons, who gets to keep the electrons more often, or who has the funner house where the electrons want to go hang out, all right? We're saying, where are the electrons tending to go? They're always going to tend to go to the higher number, okay? So one bond at a time, I look 2.5 and 4. Where do the electrons want to go? Towards the 4 or towards the 2.5? 4. Towards the 4, because it's a higher electronegativity. So the F is gonna have more electron custody than the carbon does. They're still shared, but a little more time is spent by the fluorine. Professor, um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, does it matter if I put the Fs on the bottom? No, as long as you have two Fs and two Hs, it doesn't matter where they are. Okay. Um, except for Andrew's tip that we were, or my tip that Andrew was echoing, like keep the fluorines together somewhere, keep the Hs together somewhere, mm -hmm. okay? So as I'm evaluating these bond dipoles, let's just remember the ranges. So this was in your lecture note, zero to 0.4, we said was nonpolar bonds. If I have 0.5 to 1.9, that's a polar bond. And that's where I'm gonna say, hey, the electrons are getting unevenly shared. They're moving towards something else. And then 2.0 and higher, that was an ionic bond, okay? So with my bond dipoles, this is the mindset that we want to have, kind of our, our cutoffs, all right? So here, 4.0 minus 2.5 was 1.5, so that's why it's a polar bond. That's why the electrons are getting tugged up to the fluorine more. Everybody tracking here? 
Okay, now I go to the next bond, C to F. Again, I say, oh, that's a difference of 1.5. So left or right of the bond, it doesn't matter, but I'm gonna say electrons are getting tugged towards the fluorine, okay? In that bond, remember there's two electrons here. So we're saying those electrons are getting tugged kind of in the fluorine direction. Does that make sense to everybody what those arrows are meaning there? Okay, when I get to C and H immediately, well, I can subtract, I can go 2.5 minus 2.1. And that tells me it's a nonpolar bond, essentially twins in a like perfect even sharing or perfect even tug of war that nobody can win. Okay, also C and H never get those little bond dipole arrows because they're basically sharing electrons. And so the arrow is only put on there when we're uneven in our sharing, when our numbers are really different from each other. Um, does that make sense to everybody, that statement? So an arrow comes in only when we have uneven sharing. Okay, good. Yeah, Lidiana, go ahead. Are you talking about like, we only put an arrow for the molecular structure or are you talking about the bond, bond dipoles? Like what arrow are you talking about? Just bond dipoles right now. So everything. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll get to the molecular. Thanks for checking. Eileen um, or someone else. Sorry to interrupt. From mine, I had put the H on the top. And where, and so I pretty much have the H at the top and then on your left hand side. Over here. Uh huh. And then I have the F's on the other side. So what my, there we go. That's my question that I was going to ask about as far as the arrows going. Mm -hmm. So yours would look like mine, but kind of spun around. Those are both okay. correct, correct ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, as long as they're like, they're in the right direction, that's fine. Yes. Yes. Okay. Got and it. that's a really good point to make that it doesn't, you can't mess it up as long as you're like drawing the right molecular geometry and looking at electronegativities. Um, Eileen, did you have something else to ask or add there? Oh, yeah. I was going to ask, um, so like I noticed what happens if you get like um, elements that all have like extremely high electronegativity, do you just still draw the arrows for those that have a bigger, like a higher electronegativity to direct or draw no arrows? Good question. So the only time I draw those bond dipoles is when the difference in electronegativities falls in that 0.5 to 1.9 range. So only if the difference between the two atoms, right? Because I'm always evaluating like, here's my carbon, here's my fluorine. So then I'm looking at 2.5 and 4.0. So carbon to fluorine, I'm like, what's happening at that bond? And I'm taking that difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so now I've got my bond dipoles down. Now, Lidiana, can I can I loop you in here? You want to talk to us about a molecular dipole here? What are you seeing? Yes, so I had difficulty like understanding this, but the way I understand it, I don't know if it'll help for others. So I know the difference between a bond dipole, the molecular dipole, the bond dipole, you're only looking at like, for instance, fluorine and hydrogen or whatever other molecule is around the center atom. And whereas the molecular, you're looking at everything and that's including the center itself. So for the molecular um, dipole, you'll now be taking into consideration uh, carbon. So you'll kind of see, um, for instance, um, we see that fluorine is like going up and then we see that fluorine is going like towards like, the, like an angle. So we can draw a molecular uh, dipole like kind of going at an angle. So the way I also take it is like, I kind of think of it as a, like a pizza. And then I just kind of like, uh, I kind of think about it like, okay, what side has more, like more toppings or something like that. And then that's kind of how I, I'm able to like understand it. I love that toppings. I've never heard that analogy before. So you can see, cause I'm a total, like, I want my weird toppings on my half of the pizza <laughs> kind of person. Um, so yeah. So to what Lidiana is saying, instead of just looking at a bond, now I'm looking at, the two bond dipoles, I mean, get rid of that pink, sorry. Got my bond dipoles and I'm saying, oh, all of the toppings seem to be on the left side. Maybe the right side is the cheese side, I don't know. <laughs> but where are all the toppings? Where are all those little bond dipoles pointing? 
that's where all the electrons are going to be. In this case, electrons would be our toppings. And so we're saying, hey, the electrons are going to tend to be on the upside of this molecule. Or if we had drawn it like Nancy did, Nancy, where are all of the electrons in your molecule tending to be? Um, the arrow would be going like towards the right side. Yeah. So here, can you see if the little bond dipoles are showing us where electrons are tending to be, then the big arrow is just a summary. I'm just looking at where are those little arrows pointing. And so I draw a bigger arrow, pink or just big. And I'm saying, okay, the little arrows are pointing this direction. I kind of average out the two arrows and just draw right between it. Now, my other question is, um, I understand the little arrows, they come in play if um, it's polar like there's a big difference right mm -hmm. now the pink ones are they always going to be present or no not necessarily okay okay so um let me let me scroll to some clean space here okay um <clears throat> so i gave you three different molecules and i'm just going to sketch them out here this is you had this similar thing in your lecture notes, um, but it helps to just see it again sometimes, okay? So if I have CH4, we said there's no polar bonds, right? So this is non-polar bonds. And so that means that my electrons are even in all the bonds, right? Electrons are even in all the bonds, evenly shared, okay? And so then I can also say, ah, sorry that this is a nonpolar molecule. And that means that the electrons are evenly shared on the whole pizza, <laughs> in the whole molecule, all right? So in other words, within this whole molecule, there's not electrons tending to go one way or tending to go another way. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's situation one that we can have. The second situation, you've seen carbon dioxide probably this week some. If I worked out with the electronegativities, I would find out that oxygen has a higher electronegativity than carbon does. So I've got bond dipoles. Those are telling me that electrons are tending to get pulled towards the oxygen, right? That's what those little arrows mean, tending to get pulled towards the oxygen. And that would have come from, if I looked these up, this is 2.5 and this is 3.5. So. That's why those arrows are pointing out at the oxygens, right? But now if I'm pulling evenly in two directions, I think I said it was like my twins in the video. If my twins are pulling me, let's go to the right, let's go to the left. Do we go anywhere? No, they can't, their efforts cancel each other out. So here, what I'm looking at is I would say that I have polar bonds. That's the little arrows, right? And that means that I have uneven electrons in the bonds, like the O is hogging electrons, but because those cancel each other out, I have a non-polar molecule. And I'm not grabbing that pink arrow yet because the pink arrow means overall we're uneven. Overall, one side of the pizza got all the pepperoni, okay, or got all the electrons. Tracking with me, any questions here? We're just kind of showing three different scenarios that you saw in your um, videos as well. And then the last one was the one that we worked together and drew up here. So we have, however you drew it, something that looked like this, right? We had our polar bond, sorry, I need to zoom in so I can draw better here. Fluorine was pulling electrons and fluorine was pulling electrons. So I have here polar bonds, right? Uneven electrons in the bonds. And then we were able to say, well, yeah, on the whole molecule, electrons are tending to be towards those fluorines, right? Because fluorine's pulling electrons so hard. And so now those little arrows have added up and I say that I have a polar molecule. And that is the same as saying I have a molecular, sorry, molecular dipole. And so that means in this whole molecule, my electrons are going to tend to be on the fluorine side of the molecule more than they hang out over on the hydrogen side of the molecule. 
So those are our three scenarios we can have where nothing's polar. Okay, we're looking over here. Nothing's polar here. Here we have polar bonds, but they cancel each other out. And here we have polar bonds and they add up and push all those electrons to one side or the other. Those are the only three scenarios you're ever gonna see. Professor? Yeah, go ahead, Elaine. So for the carbon and hydrogen ones, so that one you wouldn't put no dipole arrows or nothing? Nothing at so all. They like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a little shortcut back to what Tiani was helping us focus in on earlier is no matter how many C's and H's there are, this is gonna help us with intermolecular forces. You saw I gave you like some big stuff, like all of a sudden I'd be like C6, H12. And you might've been like, no, <laughs> I don't want that many numbers, right? But as soon as I see C's and H's, what am I always thinking? Polar or non-polar? Non-polar. Non-polar. So no matter how big the molecule is, I'm always having that mindset that Elaine, you were giving us where I'm like, I don't care how big it is, there's no uneven sharing. Everything's gonna be even when it's C's and H's. It's like a perfect commune where everyone just shares perfectly. Um, does that help, make sense? Yes, thank you. Questions from anyone else? Yeah, Lidiana, go ahead. Is it safe to say that we can always assume um, like when we see like, um, I guess a compound and it has fluorine that it'll always be a uh, polar? Mm, almost always. Okay. Not quite always. Let me zoom out just a little bit here. So check this out. If I have, and it doesn't matter what side you put your wedge and your dash on. I just flipped it around, but look at this molecule. Okay. Fluorine loves electrons, right? So I'm like, fluorine loves electrons, loves electrons, loves electrons from the electronegativities, right? Now what's going to happen with those four bond dipoles? Do you have a guess? Yeah, they cancel each other out. Yeah, because I have that perfect symmetry. And mm -hmm. so this ends up falling into this middle category where I say, yeah, there's uneven bonds, but they all end up canceling each other out. Okay, but that's like only for instance, if there was like uh, one element and then another element, like for example, how you just did. So if it's only carbon and fluorine, then um, well, I know that fluorine has a high electronegativity and it's, uh, well, they're going to cancel each other out. But like, for instance, um, if there's another added um, element and one of them is like, yeah, like that, then I can assume basically that it'll be polar, right? Yes. And that's okay. where those assumptions, you're getting the hang of it. That's where those assumptions speed up your intermolecular forces like work okay. later on, right? So look, here's why. Fluorine wants electrons, wants electrons, wants electrons. C and H, we never draw a bond dipole, right? Because they're sharing evenly. And so now I'm saying, well, which side of the pizza gets the toppings? I'm going to beat that metaphor to the ground here. All right. So I'm like, oh, the top and bottom arrows kind of seem to cancel each other out. They don't entirely, but I'm saying over towards the left side, the fluorine side of the molecule is where the electrons are going to hang out. And so this, therefore, as soon as I can draw that big molecular dipole, I know that it's a polar molecule. So it's an uneven electron molecule. All right. Um, so yeah, really good summarizing of that pattern. Um, fluorine's a giveaway unless you've got four of them where they all cancel each other out. Okay. It's like you could beat everyone at arm wrestling until you arm wrestle all the guys on your football team or all the girls on your football team. <laughs> you're playing whatever. And then you're like, ah, we're all super strong. So nobody's going to win here because they're, they're all pulling in that CF4. All right. Questions on that? All right. Let's take less than five minutes if you guys can handle it, because I want to get our, our best use of our time. So let's take like three minutes, okay? Um, and then we'll come back and work on intermolecular forces so you can uh, do some good practice. Can you scroll back to the uh, right there? I was like making yeah. my little side notes. Thank you. Is that too small for you? You got it? That's fine. Thanks. Okay. All right. I'll see y'all back in three minutes, okay?
Professor, I'm here. I don't know why, but my camera just like stops working sometimes in this Zoom call. And it just like doesn't turn back on, but I'm like here. Just wanna oh, that's weird. Know. Yeah, I know. I saw you earlier. Your camera just doesn't want to show up for come class. Huh? It just like literally freezes like in the middle of class. And then like once I try to turn it back on, it just keeps saying like it, there's another app using the camera. And it's like I don't have any apps on my laptop, so I don't know. Oh, weird. All right. No problem. You just keep talking and engaging. All right. Um, thanks for the heads up. All right. We'll start in just a second here. So if you guys can all find your way back to your desks, cameras, whatever. Um, Sorry, quick question. The pink arrows are the molecule, molecule dipoles? Molecular dipoles, yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Just wanted to make sure I have the right thing for them. Yeah, no problem. All right, so we're gonna jump in with our last, like we got 20, 20 25 minutes to kind of take what you've just been working on and connect it to Lewis, or sorry, to intermolecular forces. Um, so the reason we took our time through that other stuff is because it all builds, right? So Lewis structures then let us do electron geometries and molecular geometries. Those let us figure out if our molecule is polar. And then from there, I can do IMFs, okay? So in order to do the intermolecular force problems, you have to be able to tell, ah, oh, that's a polar molecule or that's a nonpolar molecule, all right? Um, so that's why what we've done so far is this and this and this, and now we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. So just to remind you in this chapter so far, we have three types of intermolecular forces, right? We have the strongest intermolecular forces, which are hydrogen bonds. And those are always going to have an NH, OH, or FH donor with an O. Oops, I wrote that wrong. Um, and you already have this in your notes. So don't feel like, like I'm not gonna be judging you on what you turn in tonight that you got every last thing I scribbled down. Like you already have a lot of this. I'm just kind of saying it so you see it again. And then we have to have an O, N or F acceptor. Okay, so that was our strongest type of hydrogen or star, strongest type of intermolecular force. What's the next one down? Do you guys remember? Dipole, dipole, dipoles. Yeah, good. I hear dipole, dipole. And we want to have the mindset of this is where those molecular dipoles that I was just working on. So when I'm able to draw these molecular dipoles, those are the same dipoles I'm talking about when I talk about a dipole, dipole attraction. Okay. So same dipoles that we were just practicing with. And just to clarify with the dipole, it's when the bigger number is like taking away from the smaller number, right? Yeah, but not so on the, by the time we get to the pink arrows, the overall, we're not looking at just the big number taking from the small number because the, num the numbers, the electronegativities we use for the bond dipoles. But then with the pink arrow, we're summarizing all of those little takeaways and we're saying electrons are getting taken to this side of the molecule or taken to that side of the molecule. I understand. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it is tied to the electronegativities, but it's also just kind of summarizing like where are all the big number elements, where are all the electronegative elements. All right. Um, and then with what's our third third type of um, IMF? Anybody? Dispersion. Yeah. Good. Okay. So we've got London dispersion forces. And those are gonna be the weakest of the three, right? So we've got strong and weak is one way to rank these. Um, now I wanna think about, get rid of this arrow here, okay. Um, which of these IMFs are present or, okay, let me back up. If I have a pink arrow here, what does that mean about my molecule? Is it polar or non-polar? Polar. Polar, good. 
So if I have a polar molecule, I can have a dipole dipole attraction. Okay. And then hydrogen bonding is actually just a super extreme version of dipole dipole. So if I've got polar molecules, then I'm going to have dipole dipole attractions and I might have hydrogen bonding too, if I have the right NH, OH, or FH present in the molecule. Okay. Um, dispersion forces are also true for polar, but I'm always looking for the strongest force. That's what's going to have the biggest impact. Okay. So we always with intermolecular forces want to think, am I polar? And if I'm polar, do I have that NH, OH, or FH present? Because then I would have hydrogen bonds. All right. Now, in terms of drawing, when I'm drawing my dipole dipole attractions, they kind of line up like little magnets there. Um, hang on a second. Uh, when I'm drawing hydrogen bonds, then we use those partial charges that you saw me using for the first time in this chapter. So this is a partially positive and a partially negative. And then in my next water over, I'll have a partially negative and a partially positive. And if we could track back to electronegativity numbers, that's where those partials come from. Um, because if I worked out where the arrows point, the oxygen is more electronegative. And so that gives it a partial negative charge. And the hydrogen is more, or a smaller number. And so it's gonna end up being partially positive to match like what we saw on that positive end of the tail. So when we draw our hydrogen bonding, we end up with those partial charges and then our dashes to show the attraction. We draw dipole dipole, we just line up the dipoles and we say, hey, the positive end is attracted to the negative end. So those are kind of the two types of diagrams that you're gonna see. And I've drawn them in the lecture notes. Um, if I draw it in the lecture notes, I might ask you to draw it in upload, right? Um, questions on the foundations here before we go use this? How about nonpolar? Where are my nonpolar molecules going to fall in these um, intermolecular forces? Uh, dispersion. Yeah. So where uh, a polar molecule will have one and two, and maybe the hydrogen bonds, nonpolar molecules, all they have are these dispersion forces. OK, so we're going to use that when we go to do the boiling point questions and stuff like that. All right, good questions. All right, so here's a couple questions that you guys submitted. Um, zoom in here, okay. So sorting these two groups of molecules from lowest to highest boiling point, okay? So again, we've kind of been doing little recipes all night. And as I'm making these recipes, like think about making your own little recipes as you study, right? Like put things in order, what comes first, what comes second, make a pattern for yourself. So first I need to know, about the polarity. Second, I can think about strong and weak IMFs. And then if I have a tie in those, then I can also think about size, okay? And with those, if I'm thinking about high boiling points or I'm thinking about low boiling points, um, what kind of intermolecular forces, it's messy kind of intermolecular forces am I going to have if I have a high boiling point? Strong IMFs or weak IMFs? Anybody? So high boiling point means it's hard to pull those molecules apart. It's hard to boil this substance. Strong. So that means strong. Good, Lucretia. So these are going to be strong IMFs. And then the opposite of that, if I have low boiling points, that means it's easy to pull the molecules apart. So what does that mean for IMFs? Weak. Weak, good. Does everybody track with that pattern? That was something you saw in your lecture notes. Um, or we could say this another way. We could say that I have many, ah, many IMFs versus less IMFs, okay? Um, what about size? How does size influence intermolecular forces? Anybody remember that from your lecture notes? Mm. The bigger that they are, the higher boiling point, and the lower, though, they have a lower boiling point. 
Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I didn't see, is that Carmen? Yes. Thank you, Carmen. Um, so bigger size, smaller size. Okay, so those are our trends. So if we know our trends and we have our little recipe, now we can figure out any boiling point problem. Okay, um, so first thing is think about polarity. So let's look at this first problem here. Okay, is HCl a polar molecule? Do we have an idea? How could we, how could we think about that? That is a nonpolar. Mm, okay, you're wrong, but let's see if we can work from that <laughs> thought. <laughs> um, what were you seeing there that was making you lean towards nonpolar, Lucretia? Oh, the C and H. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, so you might have honed in on that C and H and you're like, oh, right? I've been yeah. telling you all night. But this is, um, so this is like a little different than that. This is an H atom and then a CL atom. So that's how you want to see it is not H with C, but H with CL. So a little bit different. Does that make sense? Got it. I, I was looking at, you're not talking about C12, H26? No, we're going to get to those in a minute. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, that's what I was okay. looking at. That's my fault. <laughs> so not you, me. So we're looking at this group right here right now. Okay. So HCl, if you need to, you can look at those electronegativities real quick. Hydrogen is 2.1. Chlorine is three, maybe. Well, yeah. that's to be the opposite of what I just said, right? So it's polar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now, now that we've gotten a little better at all those bond dipoles, hopefully I'm like, oh yeah, well, chlorine is going to pull electrons, right? And so if I can draw that pulling electrons, what does that tell me? Is this a polar or non-polar compound? Polar. Polar, because it's got that molecular dipole. Everyone tracking with me? See how this builds on what we were doing before? Stop me if you've got a question. Now, what you about- repeat, You can repeat it if you would like. Just okay, <laughs> rewind. So the chlorine has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So that means electrons are getting pulled towards the chlorine and therefore it's uneven. So it's a polar molecule. The electron sharing is uneven. Is that a helpful rewind? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I say that HCl is polar. How about F2, polar or nonpolar as a molecule? Nonpolar. Non Nonpolar. That's like the C and H where it's like automatic. Anytime you see twins, you see two of the same elements, they're sharing electrons evenly. Okay. So I can say my F2 is nonpolar. And then how about H2O? That's water. And that one you should know at this point, is that polar or nonpolar? Polar. 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 All right. So now all that intuition you've been building for a couple of weeks is going to come in handy. Okay. So now I need to take those with the polarity check and think about intermolecular forces. Okay. Ooh, let's add to our little knowledge base here. Where are my nonpolar molecules usually going to go? Low boiling points or high boiling points? Low. Yeah. So usually this is where my nonpolar molecules are or atoms. And then usually I'm going to see my polar molecules with the high boiling points. Okay. Not, not always, but that's a pretty good trend. So based on that, I can take here and I can say my F2 is the nonpolar compound out of these three. So it's going to have the lowest boiling point. I just put it on that low boiling point end because it's nonpolar. Is everybody with me on that? Okay. So now I have HCl and H2O to consider. They're both polar, but let's go back to what we were thinking about here. Is one of them gonna have stronger IMFs than the other? HCl versus H2O. Yes. When H2O have a uh, hydrogen bond? Yes, ding, 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 good job, Carmen. And how about HCl? HCl has an H in it too, Carmen. So why is HCl not hydrogen bonding? Because it doesn't uh, have a, no o doesn't it. connect with the O, N, or F. 
Yeah. What it was. Acceptor, the donor and the acceptor. The donor. Yeah. So we always have to be able to see that donor, the OH, NH, or FH, if it's going to be hydrogen bonding. So if we come back down here, then we see H2O can hydrogen bond. HCl, what's the best HCl can do then for an attraction up here? That would be the dipole dipole is the best it can do because it's got that dipole, right? We said it's a polar molecule, but it's not hydrogen bonding. Do you guys see that difference there? So polar versus hydrogen bonding, we're looking for, is that OH, NH, or FH there? Okay. So when we go to sort these, then who's going to have the highest boiling point? Who's got the strongest IMFs, right? Because that's what we're looking for, the strongest IMFs. So who's got the strongest? HCl. Mm, careful. What's stronger, hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole? H2O. Yeah. So H2O, because it's polar and has hydrogen bonding, is going to be the highest. And then HCl is polar, but just has dipole dipole. And then F2 is nonpolar. So it's going to have the weakest attractions. Um, so that's how I would sort those into that ranking. Questions, rewind, re-say anything there? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So you know how you said um, at the bottom where it says usually nonpolar or usually polar, uh, polar for high, is there any incident where a nonpolar is a high boiling point or a polar is a low boiling point? Good question. So you're leading right in. It's like I paid you to lead us to our next one here, Michael. Good question. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to give you anything that's like super convoluted and confusing. Okay. But you might see something like this next one that somebody asked about that someone submitted. Okay. So now we're going to take these three compounds and rank them. All right. So let's go through those with this same checklist. Okay. So first, can everybody see those three there? All right. I can't drag them, but so I look at those three and what jumps out at you? Maybe Lucretia, this is the one you were looking at earlier, I think, right? Yes. This was the one I was looking at. So <laughs> non -polar. Yes. And how do you know that they're all non-polar, Lucretia? Because in my brain, I've trained it to automatically see the C and H as non-polar. Yes. Awesome. Now only if brain training counted as like exercise outside in the sunshine, right? <laughs> um, so you've been working hard this week. Good. So do you guys see what Lucretia's seen? It's all C's and H's. As soon as I see C's and H's, I'm like my best friend. I know you're nonpolar. I don't even have to think about you. Okay. Um, so this kind of gets to what you were saying, Michael, like, okay, now it's all nonpolar. So what do I do? Take all of those and put them on the nonpolar end. I can't do that. So that's where I'm going to go to my next piece and have to think about size, okay? Because the bigger something is, the more it can stick to something else. Kind of like throwing a big old blanket into your dryer, right? The bigger it is, the more it's just going to get tangled up in everything. So let me get rid of this here. So which of these is going to have the highest boiling point? Anybody? C12. C12. Yeah, the biggest one is going to have the highest boiling point. And then who's going to be next? C3H8. C3H8. Mm -hmm. And then who's going to be next? C2H6. C2H6. So this is an instance where I have something that's nonpolar that has a high boiling point. Um, this would be like approaching Vaseline, like almost solid E, not quite super solid. Um, and then this is going to be still nonpolar over here. And so when we had a tie, then we rank them according to size. Um, now, am I going to throw you like a nonpolar at this end and then suddenly like a polar at this end? I'm not going to do that to you. Okay. That to me is like convoluted, like too confusing for where we're at. But will I give you a bunch of nonpolar molecules and say, sort these? Absolutely. And then you're going to look at, look at their size. Okay. Um, questions to add on to that? Anybody? So, so, so what I'm understanding here is that whenever we see C and H, we know that they're nonpolar, and the smallest one is always the last one. And then mm -hmm. the one with the highest amount is always the one that's going to have the highest. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Now be careful, right? On Canvas, you know, I like to make sure that you're paying attention and thinking. So sometimes the low boiling point might be on the left. 
but sometimes the low boiling point might be on the right. So just be really thoughtful about where does it say low boiling point? Let me put my low thing there and let me put my high thing here. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just trying to make sure you're paying attention, okay? Um, what if I had another one that nobody submitted here, but what if instead I had um, like I2 and F2, and I asked you to tell me which one had a higher boiling point or a lower boiling point? Hang on one second, Carmen, and we'll get to that. Um, any ideas on how I could figure out I2 and F2, who was bigger? The periodic table. Yeah, go to the periodic table, look at their masses or their atomic numbers. It's all gonna give you the same thing. So who's got a bigger mass, iodine or fluorine? They're both in group seven. Iodine. Iodine, so then I would say iodine has a higher boiling point than fluorine. And sure enough, this is where the solid liquid gas piece comes in. And I don't have one of those questions on your quiz tonight, so I'm not going to take time to talk about them. Okay, boiling point is all you need to know. But it turns out that iodine is a solid at room temperature and fluorine is a gas. So that's another piece we could put into our little columns here. Um, solids and also liquids, those are going to tend to be over here with my high boiling points. And then gases are my low boiling points. So when you have those solid liquid gas questions, if it says which is most likely to be a gas, that's gonna be your lowest rank. And if it says which is most likely, I need a different color on that. If it says which is most likely to be a solid, or sorry, a gas, lowest rank. And if it says which is most likely to be a solid or liquid, then we're looking at our highest rank. So that's how this same problem fits into a different conversation as well. Um, Carmen, go ahead. Okay, uh, so now I have another question with that. So a solid would be the middle rank? No, so solid and liquid go together. Solid and liquid are both, if I think about how the atoms are arranged, the atoms are really close, whether you're a solid or a liquid. So solid and liquid just means you're really high. You have a really high melting point or boiling point. Okay. And then gas gets lumped in over here. Now I'm making a mess of this slide. <laughs> but gases, the particles are really far apart. So they're easy to separate. And those will be really low boiling points. Okay. And my other question <clears throat> for C and H, it's nonpolar only when it's those two together, right? It's and if there's another one into there like CHF, then that's, so it's solely only when it's C and H together. Yes, and that was what, I forget who it was now, I think Lidiana was looking for that trend earlier. So if you see something CH3F, now you're building some intuition, you're like, oh, F loves electrons. So even without taking all the time to go through all those steps, I know that that's gonna be a polar molecule because I'm okay. sitting here nice and non-polar Nice and nonpolar till fluorine comes along and grabs all those electrons. So then I know that's a polar compound. Okay. Thank all you. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question, Carmen. Um, any other final pieces to pull together here? Um, is there a scenario where something could have a molecular dipole, but no um, bond dipole? No, there's not. Let's go back and look here. Because the only way to have a molecular dipole is to add up the little bond dipoles. A molecular dipole is saying, where do the bond dipoles head to? And so if you don't have bond dipoles, you can't have a molecular dipole to summarize them. Does that make sense, Casey? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? We covered a lot, right? We started with Lewis structures, kind of refreshed those looked at polarity, refreshed that, and then took it to intermolecular forces. Um, when you go to take your quiz, don't get bogged down on one problem, right? Like a good test taker, try all of the problems, come back to the one that scares you the most or feels hard, or you're like, ah, I never quite got to that. But make sure you give yourself a shot on everything um, and get some partial credit on things you can draw too, okay? Um, so I want to... I'm going to stop sharing here, okay?